Hello, chefs. This is Chef's PSA Podcast. I'm your host, Andre Natera. Today is a very special episode. It is the first guest-centric episode that we're going to have on Chef's PSA. Our guest today is Casey Duty. She's a pastry chef from Chicago. She's had an extensive career as a pastry chef, including time in New York, Dallas, and now Chicago. Her experience includes working in hotels, Michelin star restaurants, country clubs. I know Casey very well, and she's extremely talented. In this episode, we're going to talk about some things that are on the top of a lot of people's minds. We're going to get into everything from the perspective of being a female chef in the kitchen, how she handles burnout and approaches her mental health. What are some career path choices to consider when becoming a pastry chef? What are some trends that are upcoming with food? and how to build a better relationship between savory chefs and pastry chefs. Without further ado, here's the interview. Casey, it's good to see you. It is so great to be in Austin. We've been trying to connect for, I don't know, for a long time, but I'll, I'll tell you one of the things that I'm really excited about. You may not know this, because I don't know how much you listen to the podcast, but this is the first Chef's PSA episode with a guest. You're the you're the official first guest. I am so honored. Thank you so much. And what's interesting about it is I get a lot of DMs from a lot of people, and there's three subjects that they always want me to talk about that I'm not qualified to talk about. So that's why I'm really glad that you're here. Okay, uh, tell they, me, what is it? They always say, what about pastries? What about from a pastry perspective? And I'm like, uh, okay. I'm not the expert. You don't want the my advice. savory chefs leave the pastry out. I like, get it. I'm going to give you bad advice. Don't ask me. The other thing they always ask me is I get a lot of questions from a lot of people that said, we'd love for you to talk about it from a woman's perspective. Mm. Uh, obviously, I have some difficulty there. I can't. My experiences that I share on Chef's PSA uh, are all about my perspective. I, I have a hard time sticking my toe in the water to say I could give it from a, from a female perspective. Yeah. And then the third thing is I know you're big time into health and wellness. Yes. The number one question I get to do an episode, can you do an episode on burnout? And so- Oh, been there, done that. We can I wanna, discuss I wanna talk all the above. I want to talk all those three things. But before we even get started, I saw your post on Instagram, I think yesterday or the day before you were you were cooking with Paula Brandt. I was. I had the the greatest honor. My friends own Sushi Bar, and you guys actually have one here in Austin, yeah. the original Sushi Bar, and they were doing a collaboration dinner. They did one, actually, I believe here not mm -hmm. too long ago. They flew him out to Chicago, and they said, hey, do you want in on it? Do you want dessert? I said, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, so it was cool. Like, back to New York roots, I was there just about under a year because COVID, uh -huh. but um, it felt really good to be back in the kitchen with that New York mindset. So for people that don't know, Paul Brandt, he was, what was the name of the chef, the restaurant that he had in New York? Was it? Uh... I didn't do my research. I, I, it doesn't matter, but he was, he had a documentary. He did. He said he had a camera crew that followed him around for 10 years. So he, I, I want to say that this documentary was very successful and he was one of the first chefs that, you know, before Chef's Table, before all this other shit that people were watching, it was like you watch the Paul LeBrant documentary, you're like, fuck, I want to cook food like that. Like he's a, he's a gangster, but he also looked like a psycho. <laughs> I don't know you. It was, so no, it was no honestly Paul to be listening. in the same kitchen and having conversations with him. I haven't had a conversation with another chef like that in a long time. And I think... There's just a mindset when you're in different cities. I'm sure Austin's mm -hmm. very different than Chicago, and Chicago is extremely different than New York. And funny enough, in our conversations, the pastry chef that I worked under and who is my mentor actually was one of his pastry chefs. And it's, it's just a small world. We're all connected. And it was really cool to just hear about like the earlier days of like my mentor who worked with him, and then it comes full circle. That's so pretty cool. What it was, were, what were it you was making? awesome. So dessert? I did dessert and it was out of my element because I'm very Italian, French, classic with a modern twist. Um, mm. And it was Japanese sushi bar. Yeah. So uh, what better than coffee, chocolate, and miso? Yep. Yeah. So I did a little rendition of almost like a custardy creme brulee. Um, it was a black sesame twill on the bottom of a set bahibe, Valrona, hello, chocolate custard. And then I torched it with a little bit of the freeze-dried miso and demerara sugar, mm -hmm. threw a bunch of chocolate crunchies in there, 
Um, in an ISI container, I made a coffee miso anglaise, but mm. when you charge it, it's a foam. Right. Um, so put that on top, some more dehydrated miso, and it's good. It was, I, I, everyone finished their plates. Okay. Let's just put it that way. Good. We'll stay humble. Um, but yeah, snow is great. And what was even better is John Shields was there with my mentor currently, my my boss, Giuseppe Tintori of GT Prime. Mm -hmm. um, and they were right in front of me. They got to witness the whole thing. Oh. And to have one of your people there and it was just it was just awesome to share that experience with so many people, friends connections mm -hmm. and and john shields for people that don't know uh chef of smith in chicago yes. and the loyalist yes three michelin stars or two he just got three he just got three shout out to those guys congratulations um that's pretty cool when when i was uh, a chef still retired now but when i was still a chef and we were opening uh, the restaurant garrison smith was the frame of reference that we said okay that's the aspirational look at what they're doing they got the bullseye that's what we need to accomplish i don't think uh, we got close to them because, you know, obviously, uh, you know, they're, 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 <laughs> they're gangsters at what they do. But um, I say that because it speaks to the admiration that I have for, for Smith and uh, Chef John Shields. It's, anyway. it's absolutely amazing. And kudos to all the stars. I know Michelin just came out with Chicago's not too long ago. And it's awesome to just see everybody evolve. So I know you've worked in some really amazing restaurants and you've also worked in a country club and you've done the hotel thing and you've done the Michelin thing. You were part of, if I'm not mistaken, you were part of the Noma Mexico team, right? I was there just to stage. So that, that was a week long trip. Mm -hmm. Um, was there to stage a, when I lived in Texas, um, I had the opportunity to do a lot of travel with Stephen Piles. Mm -hmm. And during that trip, um, we had linked up with Gabe, mm -hmm. um, and I believe he's a friend, yeah, so it's, yeah. it's awesome. Again, small world. But um, what originally had happened was, again, power of social media, like connecting with people. Mm -hmm. um, at that point in time, I was five years maybe into my pastry chefing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, it was just a really cool experience, staging in the jungle. Mm -hmm. I, I, you did the same thing for seven, eight hours that you were there, but... I mean, it, there's nothing like it. Um, you know, I, their team was definitely down there and did what they do very, very well. And we got to enjoy dinner after. So there was a group of us um, from Dallas that ate there, got to experience it. And Rene was there himself. So it was it was magical. It really was. Yeah, I bet. Um, shout out to Gabe Morales. So Gabe is the chef here at Bacalar. Ironically enough, he and I grew up on the same block. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. S Too funny. Small world, right? Um, anyway, so... Let's talk about being a pastry chef. One of the questions that I get most frequently is, I'm a young cook, mm -hmm. I don't know which direction to go. Should I go savory or should I go pastry? I always tell them, I, you might not know this, but I started out in the pastry kitchen. I did not, so my, I did not. My, my first two years in culinary were in pastry, something bad happened, we need help on the line, I went on the line, okay. I stayed on the line, I never went back. I liked it, I got addicted to it, but I wanted to be a pastry chef. One of the things that I had thought early on in my career, and one of the things that someone had mentioned to me is that the difference between a, a pastry chef and a savory chef from an opportunity standpoint mm -hmm. is that almost every restaurant will have a chef, but not every restaurant will have a pastry chef. So now understanding that as a chef, and you've been in this game for quite some time, if you had to give the sales pitch why someone should be a, a pastry chef, what would it be? You get to celebrate life's best moments through the art of dessert. Uh, from the beginning of the meal, bread service, to the end, desserts. It's something that's very special. Uh, birthdays, anniversaries, any type of celebration, you round out that meal with usually a special dessert or the kitchen knows that you're doing a celebration of some sort of occasion and they make it special. And sometimes you get really lucky and you know the chef and they do something you know off menu and send it out, but from start to finish. Mm -hmm. It's nope. a part of the experience, and I think, yes, all the food, courses, whatnot, it's memorable, mm -hmm. but sometimes that last little bite. So you talk about the passion, and there's the, the creativity aspect that goes into being a pastry chef. From a career standpoint, if you could go back and you look at your career and you say, okay, mm -hmm. knowing what I know now, 
if I would give myself advice as a young green mm -hmm. pastry student, what would you tell yourself? What would be your culinary path that you would redirect yourself with? Honestly, now I wish I would have traveled earlier in my career. Mm -hmm. um, there's opportunities that schools have to go to France and do internships in Europe. Um, and I, I really wish I would have had the courage to do that. Mm -hmm. um, at the time when I did go to culinary school, I went to the Art Institute. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of when they were in that limbo phase of transitioning with accreditation and same thing with, I believe, Le Cordon Bleu. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like I didn't grasp enough. It was more savory than pastry. So I decided to go home. I was in Dallas at the time and went to Chicago and I went to the French pastry school and that's when I really fell in love with making pastries. Mm -hmm. um, I think their courses over there are great, but knowing that the schools had opportunities to travel, um, I definitely wish I would have done that. But looking back, you don't do it for the money. Right. I mean, money comes eventually, but you don't do it for the money. Um, you do it because, again, like I said, you celebrate life's best moments mm -hmm. uh, through the art of dessert. And to be quite honest, if you got to be patient and you have to be passionate. Mm -hmm. Two big key things. Um, read. Read your cookbooks front to back. There's tons and tons of uh, different platforms from Pastry Arts Magazine to So Good Magazine. Uh, there's certain companies that have recipes on their sites. I love For Magazine too, just to kind of browse through their recipes. But as a young cook, don't do it for the money. You got to do it for passion. Um, and then to touch on hotels and country clubs, that's more production-based. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you like to be in the trenches as far as like, doing hundreds and sometimes thousands of things, people are great at that. And then the smaller restaurants uh, like the Michelin and you know just the four walls of being in one establishment, it's a different speed. It's, mm -hmm. it's not that it's slower, but it's more precise, I feel like sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and with hotels, there's so many different avenues and outlets, whereas restaurants and, you know, in the Michelin world, you just kind of have that one focus. So it depends on what you want. It depends, I think, where your heart is, what you really truly want. I think it's a lot easier as a pastry chef to go from high production hotel, country club to the Michelin solo restaurant world. Um, there's definitely a lot of opportunity within hotels mm -hmm. and country clubs. Um, but as far as restaurants go, it's it's a hit or miss, you know. There's so look at the economy right now, mm -hmm. what's going on, and you know within restaurants. What's going on with the economy, yeah. Casey? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking I mean, about? I think great. with the, just the rooms on fire. Oh yeah, hello. <laughs> you know, I've just I've I've opened a restaurant and closed two restaurants within the last year, and you know was in a multi-unit role, and that's where you really have to look big picture. Uh, I think there's very different steps to take. It just depends what route you want to go. And you can work your way up the ladder in hotels from pastry cook to pastry supervisor to pastry sous and then chef. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those hotel pastry chefs, I feel like are very comfortable mm -hmm. and like to stay. The benefits are great. The money's great. Golden handcuffs. Unfortunately, don't wear those. <laughs> but now being in a multi-unit role it's it, it mirrors that but in a different sense of um teams like okay. i there's so many teams at each restaurant right mm -hmm. um it's not just one pastry team producing x y and z so if i'm a young pastry cook and my only objective right now is i want to learn everything i want to be exposed to bread making i want to be exposed to pastries and doughs and lamination mm -hmm. Hotels. Hotels. Yep. Um, Country clubs, I I feel like a lot of hotels now still do their lamination. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen it enough through social media and knowing people um, that they do have their lamination programs. But as far as country clubs, I remember using a lot of the, fr like, pull the freeze yeah. to bake, all that good stuff. Because... The brigo or whatever. Yes. Yeah. It just... It's what you did. Yeah. Um, 
So if you want to, if you want to build up your your skills, you'd want to start them out in a hotel or some larger operation. But if you wanted to build some finesse, you would send Michelin, them. Yeah. You send them the Michelin route. Yeah. Now, having worked in both. There's obviously culture differences, right? There's very much so. I, I always say this. Uh, sometimes you can, it's it's a little bit of a shock when you start working your way up because if you're coming from a casual environment and then you go up to the Michelin environment, the intensity is there. The details, things that seem arbitrary in one restaurant are ultra specific in another. Um, you can't slam a door or make sure your towel is folded this <laughs> way. Or very much the, so more corporate. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, where in other places you're slamming doors and you're eggs around the floor and people walking over it and a roach runs across the cutting board. I'm like, oh, that's okay. Um, and some, somewhere. <laughs> oh my God, where was this? <laughs> I'm, uh, a story for another day. But um, I guess my point is, where did you go first? Did you start at the high end and then and, and go to a more casual setting or did you go casual and then go high end or? I started at the Wit Hotel in Chicago. Uh -huh. So at, at that time, it was one of the newer hotels that, that had opened in the city. It had a great rooftop, tons of buzz. Um, it was one of those like hit hotels that were, everyone wanted to be seen at. Yep. We were busy. And I think after two years, I felt like it served its purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think you just need to know when to move on uh, because at that point, once you go from pastry cook to pastry supervisor, and that's it, until the pastry chef leaves, right? You know, mm -hmm. you're just in that role because there's nowhere up to go. Right. Um, you know, you want more for yourself. And that's where, even though it was a hotel, mm -hmm. it was still super, it was a Hilton. Mm -hmm. It was part of the like double tree uh, group of hotels, but mm -hmm. higher end. And at that point, you know, you, you did what you needed to do. The outlets, until the menu changed, you did the same thing every day. Mm -hmm. uh, banquets, charity events, all that good stuff. Weddings, cutting cakes. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. even though it was a hotel, going into the country club was a great transition. Mm -hmm. It was very similar in the sense where the country club had outlets, you had banquets, you had the charity events, you had the weddings. So it was kind of like a mirrored experience different pace but different pace slower than the hotel mm -hmm. but at the same time you cannot compare the golf tournaments and outside uh mm -hmm. gatherings fourth of july you know and a memorial day right. e easter brunch all that stuff you know yeah. you are working every holiday you are outside mm -hmm. for some of these events i remember the golf tournaments it's like how do you do pastries outside this is when i was living in texas and it's 85 plus every day with humidity. Uh, so we got really creative. I think the boundaries creatively were, were pushed because it wasn't like a normal country club. The finesse was, was sort of a bit there. I had an amazing, amazing chef over there, Robin Murphy. Shout out to you. He came from hotels. Mm -hmm. He was an executive chef at a hotel. So kind of having that mixture of that high end, High production meets finesse mm -hmm. was a really cool experience at a country club because not too many country clubs do that. It's this is it, this is how it is. We're not going to change it. Membership. Th this this is what you get. Mm -hmm. um, so at that point in Dallas, there were so many cool things going on, and in the four walls of a country club, it's very private. Right. You can't participate in that tastemaker event or you can't, you know, do some of those local events that are happening. And so some of your some of your networking is it's limited and some of your very much so um, some some of your reach to the community to get to know you as a chef is limited when you work in a hotel or a country club, more so a country club, probably than a hotel. Yes, it's very private. Um, and especially if you got a PR person behind you sure. uh, or a, a managing director of a country mm -hmm. club that says, hey, take that down. Oh, yes. Been there, done that. Um, no photos. I mean, the amount of, I don't want to call them like celebrities, but the people that would walk yeah. through the doors. Um, you know, we did something and the Heisman Trophy was there and a lot of NFL players and presidents and just just all types of walking life. But yes, there's there's definitely that like little NDA side of yep. it's you don't sign one, but um but it's you very want to private. keep your job, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and at yeah. that time, 
I was 23. I became an executive pastry chef at the Dallas Country Club at 23. So let's stop right there. Crazy. Super was young. It, was it a lot of pressure because you're 23, you're a female, mm -hmm. um, uh, in a predominantly male-driven... All males. And, yep. Even in the pastry department? Um, the pastry chef before me was a male. Yes. So what I've noticed in my career is that even though it is... A, a larger portion of males in the kitchen to females. And I think that's that's changing. I think mm -hmm. it's probably more 50-50 split now. But definitely years ago, it was probably like 70-30. Um, and then depending on where you were, you might be the only female in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So being, Many 20, times. being Many 23, times. being a female, mm -hmm. and leading a team, and it sounds like they were all male, what were some of the challenges that you faced specifically around being a female, or were they just strictly leadership challenges regardless of gender? I never really faced a lot of the gender aspect to this conversation. More so it was my age, mm -hmm. how young I was, mm -hmm. the experience. Um, definitely had to prove myself because of that lack of or the age. Mm -hmm. You know, the age is like, oh, she's young. She doesn't know what she's doing. But then you'd make a dessert, super cool, creative. Okay, yeah, you know what you're doing. Right. Done. Um and I think the chase of that, like trying to prove yourself, uh -huh. that outweighed more of the, the gender-specific challenges. But what I will say is I've always been the only female. I've, I've always had chefs above me that were male. Uh -huh. So to talk on this like male-female thing, I never there, – there's people out there that, God bless, you know, they have their stories and – Kitchens, you know, have a wrap for certain yep. situations. Never had to experience it. Mm -hmm. But because of visually how I looked, I was younger, you know, blonde hair, you know, cute small girl, you know, walking in a kitchen. It was always like, oh, she doesn't know what she's doing. Or, oh, you're cute. And people would hit on you. And that's where it's like the flirtation in the kitchen was more of a problem than again, being a female, like gender-wise, wasn't treated any differently. But everyone was older than me, like a right. good like decade plus. And at that point, it did work to my advantage uh, when I was at the country club because all of the chefs there, if you do listen to this, you're amazing. I love you. I miss you guys. But they really helped me with leadership skills. Like mm -hmm. Dallas Country Club set me up as a leader, as a manager, mm -hmm. to have those skills. And the pastry team over there, most of them stayed for the five years that I was there. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have too much overturn there. But again, a lot of the pastry cooks mm -hmm. were at least 10 to 15 years older than me. Interesting. And it's really hard to manage people who are older than you because they look at you and they're like, well, you're younger than me. And right. that's when they don't call you chef. They call you by your first name. And they feel mm -hmm. like there's some level of respect there. That... It's a little passive aggressive thing, right? Like, <laughs> like in kitchens where, where, when they know you're the chef, but they still they still call you by your first name and they stop call, and they don't mm -hmm. call you chef. And I still get that. Yeah. I still get that. Um, it's interesting how that works. Um, mm. But you know what? It it makes you stronger. And luckily, I don't have any crazy horror stories other than recently I uh, had somebody say, you know, let me apologize. I judged you when you were walking into the kitchen. I looked at your Instagram. I didn't think you knew what you were doing. And and I need to apologize because you you actually, like your dessert was phenomenal and thank you so much for your help. And I was impressed. Don't judge people by their, don't judge anyone by their Instagram. Nope. You know, it's, it's funny. Uh, I'd like to talk about social media, be, but before we talk yeah, about social media, I want to go back to something that you said. Um, so you're 23 mm -hmm. and you're a leader, but you're also a creative. And you mm -hmm. want to create beautiful desserts and you want to set the world on fire and you want to express yourself through the yes. food that you're making. And you're still, because you're 23, I think realistically, you're also still learning. Very much so. So how did you balance um, the leadership mm -hmm. with uh, the wanting, still wanting to be the creative force behind the culinary pastry department? I will say Dallas is one amazing food city mm -hmm. and with that creative aspect and the leadership aspect I had the tools to help me in that leadership role learning all of that 
the creative came from eating out, networking through chefs. Mm -hmm. And at that time, that's when they did the stars. They had that star system. It wasn't Michelin. It was like the Dallas but it, News? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And by the way, four star chef right here. <laughs> California News. And, clap, and clap. twice uh, best chef DFW 2011, 2012. But I'm not bragging. See, people like you. I mean, it was you got to know certain chefs, network with them. You know, you'd go out, you'd have conversations, you'd talk about cookbooks and the hospitality industry in Texas. Yeah. It's hard to explain because until you experience it, it's like none other. And I think that's really where you piggyback off each other. There's a lot of collaborations. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone knows each other. They're yes. all at the same events. Yes. There's, there's always the after party that they're all going to get together. Wasn't going to talk about that, but yes. But, <laughs> but it's true. And it's, uh, I, I jokingly say, um, it's, like the, it's like the Illuminati, right? Because what people don't understand is like, if you get in, you get into that group, you get into all of them. Yes. Right. Because let's just say you get into this restaurant group and that chef runs in those circles. You're now you're able, going there, too. You're, you could go to all these restaurants now and everyone knows you and everyone's talking uh, to the sous chef that the chef brings with them to the events or yep. the pastry chef because they're like, hmm, they're going to be somebody one day. I might need them to be my chef de cuisine later. or I might need them to be my pastry chef. So um, you just hit the nail on the head. That's yeah. exactly how it goes, how it went. And. I think through that networking and going to the events and kind of being behind those four walls of that private entity really catapulted wanting to do all that stuff and being a part of those events. Mm. Um, and there's just so many, I could li like make a list of so many people and be like, Oh my gosh, thank you. Because it, if it wasn't for the chef friends and chefs in Dallas, I wouldn't be where I am today. Yeah. And working with so many local farms and purveyors, and there's just so much local available in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, Different from Chicago? I mean, you have your farms that you do work with, but I don't know. Dallas is different. Yeah. I, it, it's, there's something different about like farm to table, garden to table. Mm -hmm. And I really got passionate about that when I was living in Texas. I was a part of a program that did garden to table lunches at schools. Mm, oh, that's cool. And so there's there was really that momentum of, you know, d doing stuff with vegetables and fruits that mm -hmm. people were growing and people started, you know, doing the greenhouses and compost programs and that's where the Dallas Country Club my last 2 years there we created that. So that's it was right. really cool to grow the violas and you know the mint and the basil and everything that we were using mm -hmm. cuz literally we'd drive a golf cart out there, pick it Go back into the building and use it. So I used to have a restaurant uh, in Highland Park, right by the Dallas Country Club, by the Highland Park Village. I have no idea about this. You didn't know that? <laughs> no. oh. oh my gosh! Tell yeah. me. So you know where the uh, the movie theater is, right? The Marquee yeah, yeah, Movie right Theater. There. So uh, the group that we were with owned the restaurants right next door and the movie theater. Okay. Um, anyway, I used to drive by the Dallas Country Club all the time, and I'd be like, "What is back? What's what is back behind there? those gates? What's behind so those what's gates?" What's behind those gates? And I had some friends that worked there back at the time, back in back in those days. But uh, yeah, Dallas is a good food scene. And um, what I find really interesting about Dallas, and I'll tell you this because I, I, it segues into the the next conversation about social media, is when I was in Dallas, I started to kind of understand social media a little bit. When I say a little bit, I mean like a little bit. Like Instagram was still relatively very new, new yeah, relatively new. And I was like, what do I post on here? Um, mm -hmm. Do I post a food picture or, or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and Instagram eventually became a chef's portfolio and a chef's resume. And so you wanted to, I mean, you were stealing ideas because you were looking at what other people were like, oh, that's oh, yeah. that's a cool idea. We should do that. Or make sure they're in Chicago so no one in Dallas knows we're taking it or Hong Kong. Or I wherever. have so many funny <laughs> stories about social media and this, this topic because I worked for a chef who I no longer talk to. Um, not to spill tea or anything. I know people love that on podcasts. Yeah. Um, but I worked with a group, you know, moved on. And it was funny because one of the holiday parties, like, you know how managers, you know, oh, it's Christmas, let's go, let's all go yeah, out to yeah, dinner. Yeah. Uh, and we did that. And I remember, like, wanting to order a specific pasta. I was like, ooh, that sounds really good. And the chef was like, no, 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 no. Like, I had it, you know, two weeks ago. Like, 
let's order something else because it was like family style yeah. and um a really cool place in, sh- in the city of chicago um Okay, we'll get to the story, Casey. But yeah, it was the same dish that was on our menu. Like that was put on like two yeah. weeks ago. To to the tea of all the ingredients and garnishes. Yes. Just in a different format. Like the pasta was just a different shape. So one of the, because you see that a lot. I, I don't think you see it as much anymore because it's very right. policed because everyone has Instagram. We're all following yeah. the same chefs. We're all looking at the same food. Um, so you you got you to gotta be a little bit more sneaky or give credit. Say, I, I stole this from so Credit so-and-so. is huge. Credit is yep. huge. So if you're going to take someone's dish, give them credit. Um, but yeah, that's definitely happened to me many times as well. Um, and then you, it's not like this anger that comes up. You're like, you're just like, gosh, dang it. You know, like, how well, do you think they're copying pissed. me? I was pissed. And, and the t- ego, yeah. Well, that's not why I was pissed. Because everyone's like, well, flattery is the, I was like, that sure, is true. but I'm not on top yet. They were on top. So when they're already getting all the press for something that I'm getting ignored for that I created, I would get frustrated because I'm like, you're the A list. I'm the, I'm on the you're come the up. You're the B plus, yeah. A minus I, list. I, I, I'm, I'm on the come up. <laughs> you're already established. You shouldn't be stealing from me. I should be stealing from right. you. Right. And when someone that's above you takes your ideas and gets credit for it and you're on the come up, sure. I, I find that like, uh, it's a little, for me, it's I have something stage. very similar that happened, but it wasn't so much social media, but it did have to do with media. Mm-hmm. Because as you know, you know, executive chefs always tell their suits what to do and then uh-huh. follow Sue and you do it. And that's what's in the photo, right? And you're right. like, no, like it's my, like I did that. I made those macarons. Like, right. I did, you know, that I really did that. And so I, I think you get that like itch, yeah. you know, the media and the articles. And the attention, and the right? Attention. Attention's a hell of a drug. And people view it in a way that's like, oh, you just want to be famous. No, you just want to be recognized for your hard work because you spend 10, 12, 13, sometimes 15 hours a day in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. And you just want to be, you know, validated. Like, this is amazing. This tastes great. It's beautiful. And that's where, too, social media, I'll say, it's helped my career. Yep. It has oh, so. skyrocketed my career. Not so much like, oh, I've got this many followers or got this many likes, but networking through different companies. Mm-hmm. Um, there's just to touch on Val Rona, they do a calendar mm-hmm. every year. Mm-hmm. You post a photo, you do your hashtags, and you get chosen, you know, if you're the lucky one. Um, and it just so happens, not last year's magazine or last year's calendar, excuse me. But the year before, one of my dishes, Mm -hmm. I was Miss June or whatever the month was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, since the start of that, that kind of really propelled, um, you know, people liking things on social media. You know, your name's out there. It's a very established company. People want to follow it. They see your name. Then you get likes and people recognize your work. And, um, you know, from there, even opening the restaurant after that. Of magazines and you know opening day and I had this dessert by chef Casey Duty and mm-hmm. it's just it it's it it's one one thing after the other and it propels and people on their phone all the time I mean how many times do we see cooks in the kitchen like sneaking their phone right like everybody is on their phone uh, so you can't tell me people aren't looking on social media but so if you were going to give someone in pastry mm-hmm. social media advice they're they're new they want to get their brand out there they want to get recognized or maybe they want Mm -hmm. even more opportunities and they want doors to open for them what are some tactics um that you would you would tell someone to say hey this is take a blank slate start doing this on your social media do not post your personal life number one agreed if you strictly are using this for the benefit of we're going to say pastry because cats, this though? is... What about their cute cats? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I don't care. And it's there's nothing worse than being on social media and one of your cooks following you. And then you're like, oh, let me see. Like, let's just click on this. I'm like, gosh, I did not want to see that they did that last night. No wonder why they're slacking at work today. Right. Um, but I'll also say, too, as an executive pastry chef, I never followed my cooks. Yeah. Anytime I, I that they a, would follow me. I had a rule. I would never follow anyone that I might have to fire. Oh, that's a good one. But if I have to, if you're in a position where I might have to fire you, I can't follow you. I like it's just that. awkward. I like that. But as far as younger cooks, post everything. Post for, I mean, when you're taking pictures of making bread or videos or, mm-hmm. um, you know, if you're part of something at work and you want to take a photo or a video, ask the executive chef 
hey, can, can I take a photo of this? Can I post this? I'm really proud of that. Mm -hmm. I think that goes a long way. Also, hashtags, apparently. I'm, I'm not that great at hashtags, but I've noticed the at and the hashtags and mm -hmm. um, tagging companies, and you can tag certain products through like a shopping cart or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, chocolate companies and um, chef jacket companies, you know, I tag them all the time and the, the ambassadorships and the partnerships you have, um, when you're loyal to them as a pastry cook uh -huh. and you advance into being an executive, it goes a long way. So the loyalty behind some of these brands. I want to talk about trends. Mm. Um, and I'm not sure if you're where, where you, where you fall on this. Are you like classic pastry? You know, I still am. Or do you like the modern, the new, or is it somewhere in between? Where do you fall? Skills and approaches as far as the modern, like the molds and, you know, yeah. certain techniques. I love all of that, but classic for sure. I'm French, Italian, classically trained. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the industry is going plant-based, vegan-based, you know, there's plant-based chocolate. What's the Rolls Royce <laughs> of chocolate? Uh, I'm, I'm saying it too much on this podcast, but Valrona. Um <laughs> The Rolls Royce of chocolate, I just say it because it's so, like, the texture, the taste, the notes on it. Once you're introduced to really, really great chocolate, yeah. it's hard to get a Hershey's bar or yeah. eat anything other than that. Um, but It's not hard for me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I eat Hershey's bar. I'm like three out the wheel. Uh, <laughs> so it, there's definitely a texture difference. You kind of, t like, aftertaste, you know, like when you're having, like, yeah. sugar-free things and you taste like the aspartame it's not sure. that necessarily but it is like you can you can taste a difference so, so you think we're moving in general more towards vegan desserts than vegan taste. desserts plant-based like anything that's dairy-free i've seen a lot of things start introducing like potato starch mm. um it's 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 interesting a lot of molecular um, you know, take cream out to introduce more glucose and add more of these ingredient like powders as mm -hmm. far as like thickening agents. Yeah. Um, and I just have, I don't know that I've never, not that I've never been a fan, but old school way, like you don't, you don't put any of that stuff in. Yeah. In eggs, your work. Sugar, it's just, flour. yeah, eggs, yeah, <laughs> eggs, sugar, flour, butter, yeah. milk, cream, but. It's it's been interesting to kind of see where trends are going, and I think with inflation and prices going so high, right? You know, the cost of cream it makes sense. So let's take out this cream to add this, you know, mm. starch for as like a like a fatty thickener, mm. and you you only have to use X amount. And the the product you know in long term longevity is yeah. half the cost. So a lot of things. That's interesting. Cost driven. The, the, the cost, cost driven. I didn't, I didn't even consider that, right? Uh, that you know, the fifteen cost is grams driving. of this versus fifteen hundred grams of cream. You well, know what I mean? Well, one thing that's not discussed a lot on the savory side, and uh, is that when they did the protein flip, which is reduce the ounces or grams of protein on the plate and and increase the amount of greens or vegetables on the plate. Um, part of that was cost driven. Is that the plate still looks full, but we only have You're three ounces of protein. You're tricking your eyes. I'm sorry? Tricking the eyes. Yeah, but the, you only have a little bit of protein, but the plate still looks full and we're still charging the mm -hmm. same. So it was a little bit of, uh, it was a little bit of uh, smoke and mirrors there. But was it, was it branded at market as like, of course, it's healthy. We want you to eat mm -hmm. more plant forward and blah, blah, blah. Sure, certainly. But it was also financially driven. So uh, I'm not saying that the vegan dessert trend is financially driven, but it at the end of the day, people forget that the restaurant world is a business and you got to make money. And decisions are made often based on finances because it's not a playground. Um, Definitely not. I've felt that very much so lately. And I got knocked down to my knees not too long ago. What happened? Just contracts changing. Yeah. And um, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. So can you talk Yeah, about we'll elaborate on it. So I think when... It, you have a lot of mental clarity. Mm -hmm. You tend to, I don't want to say manifest, but like the abundance of opportunities that come to you when you're so clear-minded, mm. I think is different than when you're doing the whole racehorse of 
running five properties, you right. know? Mm -hmm. um, and with, you know, labor costs and, you know, just, just everything, such high inflation, a lot of these restaurants that are closing, mm -hmm. it, it makes a hit. The company, you know, I, I'm trying to like talk about this in terms where people aren't going to be like, what are you like? Oh, I know what she's talking about. Right. Um, but to like see cooks have to transition to certain other restaurants because one closes and, mm -hmm. you know, one was getting paid X amount here. So you kind of got to mirror it at this property and this property really can't afford, you know, $25 an hour for a pastry cook who works the line at night. But I mean, the, the base pay now, what I'm seeing in Chicago is nothing less than 24. Mm. And that's really hard to budget with. Yeah. So now we're seeing a trend going into summer where we're slower. We come off the holidays, you know, Mother's Day is coming up. Mm -hmm. Um, the kids will, you know, kids will be out of school. You don't have as busy of a restaurant as you did over the winter months and you got to cut labor, right? So yeah. who's working those shifts? Hello, me, you know, yeah. pastry chef. Well, welcome back. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's been an interesting flop and to see it all happen, but I am making the the lesser half of the amount of money that I used to make, and I'm the happiest I've ever been. Interesting. So I, I did a podcast recently where I talked about how most people's happiness at work is not really financially driven like people think. It usually has to do with, you know, the, uh, the other needs being met. Um, anyway, people need to go listen to that podcast on why people leave jobs for yeah. if they want to hear more about that. But... I do want to ask you, because you kind of touched on it a little bit, mm -hmm. um, and we touched on it a little bit at the beginning, is one of the biggest things that I get questions on is how do you deal with burnout? Now, I view burnout differently, so um, I don't want to give my thoughts because I don't want to skew what you're going to say. Mm -hmm. So how do you personally deal with burnout, and how do you view burnout specifically in the culinary world? Okay, we could talk about this in two ways. Do you want me to talk about it as a young cook, or Either do you want way. me to talk about it now? I, let me just... I, I we'll think the young cooks are the ones asking. Okay. Yeah. Self-care. Mm -hmm. Eat breakfast. You know? Drink your water. Exercise. I get that it's fun going out, and I get that it's fun, you know? Yeah. You're in those young stages, drinking, going out. In five, six, seven years, you're... It doesn't matter. Yeah. It does not matter. Uh, I find fulfillment, truthfully, in working out, eating healthy, and taking care of myself, whether that's – I'm really into podcasts, and it's funny, like, we're sitting here on a podcast, but I find enjoyment in listening to podcasts and audiobooks. Uh, you know, when I was a younger cook, I used to have a notebook, and I used to write down places I'd want to go, whether it would be eating, traveling, um, you know, just different goals. I would even like salaried amounts, right? Like I would write numbers down and people that I wanted to work for or mm -hmm. cities that I wanted to live in. And I really set myself up with some goals. And I think that's why I was so successful being an executive pastry chef at 23. I, I took care of my mind, body, and soul. And that's where I think some people get too caught up in this hospitality, Chef facade life. like chef life yeah, yeah, yeah um and you don't have to like you don't have to be and that's where you know there's a there's a line that gets crossed sometimes with you know co-workers like you work with certain chefs after the shift you go out you drink you come back to work the next day and mm -hmm. it's the same cycle but i i do find fulfillment in taking care of myself i'm huge into working out um i always say body by berries because i am a Barry's boot camp girl. I go every day. I have my routine, mm -hmm. uh, seven twenty-five in the morning. Uh, definitely sleep too. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I just need like four or six hours of sleep. Trust me. When I was a young cook in Chicago, yeah. starting out my career, I would go out. But this is why I'm giving you this advice because yeah. I already did it. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. I know way too, way too what, much about that lifestyle. Routine? Do you have a routine like for sleep? Now I, so I juggle. A 10-hour day. Do you use uh, the Aura Ring? 
I don't. I wear my Apple Watch. I'm crazy. Um, it's like a 14-hour stand goal, a thousand calorie move day, mm. and you know, an hour of exercise. And I am crazy about closing those ranks. Some there's something about it. Like I'll never forget when we were opening um, Les Select. I was in the stairwell, running up and down. Like n- not that we had like free time, but there's a lull sometimes in mm. between service. And of course, pastry is the last thing people eat. So at five o'clock, when the restaurant opens, it's slow. I want to be up and down the stairwells, you know, like doing my steps just to make sure I hit my goals on my watch. Because that's how crazy I am with uh, being a health nut. But at the same time, too, it's really hard to juggle. Because what do you do every day? You you, you eat desserts. Yeah. You you know, I'm tasting sugar all day long, and I've gotten to a point now that I it's like almost like a sommelier. Yeah. I just taste it, taste it enough where I'm not consuming it. If I need, if I t- take a piece of bread, I, sometimes I spit it out. Like mm-hmm. I, I don't, I know it sounds crazy. I've been labeled too before like, oh, she's got an eating disorder. No, I just don't want to consume bread and, and, you know, chocolate this and, you know, ice cream that. And, you know, it's all the bad things, right? Like dairy, gluten, sugar. Yeah. I, it's... Uh, it's never ending. So definitely take care of yourself. But now, I mean, I remember when I was in New York, mm-hmm. I would wake up at four o'clock in the morning to get on a 530 train, mm-hmm. be on the train, walk into work at, you know, 6 a.m. And um, I never saw the sun. Yeah, I never saw the sun and the little a things of, you take for granted. Take that for granted because I would get depressed. When I would yes. go in and it's dark and I'd leave when it's dark and I used to hate exactly. that. Exactly. All you saw were the four walls of the basement, you know, prep area and then service was upstairs and you never saw the sun. Yeah. Not seeing the sun. And and, and again, sometimes working in a basement and you, you got those fluorescent lights mm-hmm. in the kitchen. Uh, like just, just get outside. Look at the sun. And I think to stare into the sun, <laughs> look at the eclipse. <laughs> oh yeah, that just happened, didn't it? I think too, what's really important to touch on is therapy as well. Yeah. I don't think people really value their mental health, mm-hmm. to be honest. And I know chefs have a little bit of a bad rap for this too, but it's never too late to ask for help. I know I've had tons of pastry cooks who have, su- you know, not I don't want to say suffered, but who have touched on this topic and said, "Hey, you know, I'm." I'm I'm depressed. I, you know, certain situations they'd share. And at that point, everyone's a human. And yeah. when I would interview people for positions, I'd say, first and foremost, before you walk into these doors, you're a human. So if, if you need help, if you need, you know, time off, let me know. Mm-hmm. Let me know. You know, speak up. So I think that's also very important, too, is um, dealing with emotions, health healthfully if that's a word mm-hmm. um that's huge journaling i mean i know some people aren't into that but i've just in in my position i've noticed uh once you're clear-minded mm-hmm. at work a lot of success happens yeah I'm a, I'm a big believer in journaling i journal every day i write a mm-hmm. lot um i have a question if the show's called chef's psa yeah every day i put up stupid chef's psas some of them are not stupid some of them are good But if you had a pastry chef's PSA, something that you would want to make sure that everybody in the pastry world heard and you had it on a billboard, Mm. what would your pastry chef's PSA be? Have your cake and eat it too. Expand upon that. I am such a believer in the word yes, Mm -hmm. but you also have to understand when to say yes and when to say no. Mm -hmm. And... Whatever you want to obtain in this lifetime, in the time span of your career, do it. What, whatever you have to do to get there, whether it's move to a different city, work for a certain chef. I mean, there's definitely steps you need to take to be at a certain level. Mm-hmm. Do it. You know, as, as silly as it sounds, just do it. Like, well, this is not a Nike ad, but, you know, but it's... It's so easy. Like it's, it's so complicated, but it's so easy. And studying this art and this craft, patience. I think patience is huge. Um, throughout my entire career, I've always had pastry, chef, you know, executive pastry chefs. While I was a pastry cook, like patience, like mm-hmm. take your time. I used to think, you know, as an employee coming up, working under chefs or working in groups or whatever, 
the loyalty aspect of you need to be here for quite some time. Um, mm-hmm. you know, three the years, two year, two like years, minimum, wh- yeah. Whatever. I don't know if I agree with that anymore um, because, because now my role is different. I'm, not, I'm no longer uh, giving advice as the chef where it's my best interest that you stay mm-hmm. because now most of the people that I work with on Chef's PSA are people that want my advice. So I'm not going to steer them wrong. And having no. been on both ends, yeah. I know that like, hey, they're dangling a carrot. They're, they're kicking the can down the road. They're mm-hmm. never going to promote you. Um, so sometimes you just have to create action. So inaction sometimes is the absolute worst thing for a cook because inaction could become paralyzing because you sit there and you wait. I'll mm-hmm. wait another year. They said, I'm not ready. Then you wait another year. You're still not ready. And before you know it, you've wasted five years there. When in year one, you could have just gone to that other It's place. like relationships, right? Yeah. You know, I mean. Because, I mean, it is. It, it, Working in a restaurant is a relationship. Oh, yeah. You it's see the best those and people more than your own family. Yeah. You know, I can count on every birthday, every holiday. I was not home. And mm-hmm. I think that's where this work-life balance comes in. And and at a certain point after you've done your duties, as far as like working your ranks up, mm-hmm. you want to be home with your family on a holiday. Yeah. Um, and, and you deserve that. And that's why I say you can have your cake and eat it too. I'm a prime example of that. I put in the work after... 10 years of straight hustle Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from Dallas to New York to Chicago. You can have it all. You just have to realize how to make it happen. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I I do say on burnout, uh, because I I don't really like talking about it too much because I'm not a big burnout believer. I either think I'm not either. I'm very competitive. So so the burnout thing, it's, it's it's like, I don't get burned out. I, I push yourself a little harder. I still work seven days a week. I work seven days a week and I'm retired. And I work seven days a week, still so 10 hours a day. you're not retired. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm retired from being a chef. <laughs> yes. But uh, the reason I bring that up is because my thought on burnout is you're dealing with two extremes. If it's too slow, you get bored. Yes. And so you're, you're like, I don't like my job. It's boring. I'm not learning. Right? But it's just slow. And if it's too busy, it gets hard. And when it's hard, I'm burned it's, out. Yeah. Uh, I'm not getting any days off. And so you're, what most cooks want is they just kind of want this comfortable middle. Like the warm bed. It's hard like to about find the, covers, that comfortable metal. You know, about 45 hours a week. Like you, you want that comfortable middle. Once you go over or a little under, and it's like you get burned out. But I always say it's like if you take a kid who enjoys doing something, like a video game or whatever, yeah. like you have to peel them out of their room. Like I hear stories At about some kids point, right? have to like their, their parents have to say, stop playing games. We can't get because they love it. The they they love them. what they're doing. And when you love what you're doing as a chef, I know chefs. I, I've been that chef. It's mm-hmm. like you cannot get me out of the kitchen. It's not because I'm overworking myself. It's because I love it. I'm passionate. Yeah, and I, just so I was wanna... just going to say passion. It's the passion behind the creativity, the art of it. And honestly, knowing that you're sharing that with somebody is really special. Right. And so just to close my thought on what I was saying – is I think when people say that they're burned out, I always push back a little bit and say, are you burned out or do you just not like your job? Mm-hmm. Like, are you really burned out or do you just not like the job? And so I think that is usually arbitrary number, but I would say it's probably like 80% of the time you just don't like your job. I always say you are a product of your environment. Yep. And at that point, if it doesn't bring you happiness and it's, it's a constant, like I've noticed when you bitch and complain, and especially when you go home and you bitch and complain about your work, um, what relationship you have at home, I mean, it suffers usually yeah. 99% of the time. And it's like, you are not happy at work. You are not the person I know. Find a job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> find leave. a new, leave. find you're a not, new job. You're not job. handcuffed to the stove. You no. feel free to leave. Yeah. And at this point, I think we're in 2024, the respect level. Yeah. It's, I mean, people want respect more than the paycheck sometimes I feel like. Yeah. Um, I've noticed a lot of cooks do bounce around and you're touching on resumes and there's a lot of young cooks to a certain point. It's, they just want the respect. They'll be like, Oh, I'll take $20 an hour. But I, you know, this chef over here, you know, they said, blah, blah, blah to me. And this is what happened. It was, it was a bad scenario where it's like your ego got to you. Yeah. You use the word burnt out. Let's say they were burnt out and they're looking for a new job because they felt disrespected. Yeah. So, Again, product of your own environment. And I think this resume thing is going back to the social media. Yeah, you get resumes sent to you. You look at resumes, but it's usually about the stage. What do you mean? 
Oh, so, oh, so like, when they're applying, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like work. you'll you'll look yeah. at their resume and you'll be like, oh, okay, cool. And then you'll invite them in. And sometimes the people with, you know, the lesser part of the exciting part on your resume end up being the best hires. And yeah. they're so eager. I I do love also working with culinary schools. Mm-hmm. Um, I've I've done a lot with internship programs as well. Mm-hmm. And when you get pastry students freshly out of school, it's like they're a sponge. Like they just want to learn. Mm-hmm. And that's really important when you're in that leadership role to feed into it mm-hmm. because we really are shaping the next generation of cooks. Yeah, it's our most important job. If uh, So I, I, I want to I have two last questions for you. Yes. First one is sometimes the relationship between the head chef, the chef de cuisine, the executive mm-hmm. chef, and the pastry chef, they don't always see eye to eye. If you could talk to executive chefs and chef de cuisines that are listening right now, what's one thing that they could do to make that relationship better or maybe something that they don't understand about the mind of a pastry chef? It's very calculated to the point where, you know, what's on the plate, it's it's grammed out. You know, like it's 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 science just as much it is as it is um, art. Same thing on the savory side. So that's why you kind of have that conflicting, you know, back and forth. But at the same time, it takes way longer to plate a dessert sometimes than it does in a savory aspect. And when you are working with savory chefs, certain ingredients are like the balance of acid to salt and, you know, the ratios of certain things in your taste buds. Um, I've noticed the bigger the ego, Mm -hmm. the stronger the statement, Mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Um, You know, we're, we're all like collectively on the same team. So what I like to always think about, and I guess what I want to say is, I'm just as much so on your team as you're on my team. Mm -hmm. So the more that we're on the same page, the better the outcome. And I've really never had too many conflicting things with the CDC because I really do love as a pastry chef, I will always go to the CDC or the executive chef or whoever whoever I'm working with daily Mm -hmm. and really get their interest of what I'm doing. Uh, You know, share, hey, taste this. What do you think of that? And kind of bounce ideas off of each other. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's kind of like, just be open. Be open to like, what I'm saying kind of trusts me a little bit too. I've noticed mm-hmm. when you explain certain desserts mm-hmm. to executive chefs, they just kind of look at you funny and just like give you this look and you're like, no, 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 like trust me, trust me. Yeah. Like, I, I know what I'm doing. So it's a little mixture of that. So last question. Um, what is the biggest misconception that people have about becoming a pastry chef? And what I what I'm trying to say is like, I want to be a pastry chef because I've been watching a lot of TV. I watched, I don't know what the shows are, Ace of Cakes. I don't even know yeah, if that's still yeah, a show, yeah. but but I want to be a pastry chef. I know nothing about the industry, but I'm going to go to culinary school. I'm going to be a pastry chef. And then you get into the real world. What's the biggest misconception? The shocking moment then, like mm-hmm. when reality just smacks you in the face and say, oh, it's not Ace of Cakes. Yeah, and it's nothing what you see on TV. TV shows you little snapshots of the best moment of of what we do as a pastry chef uh, between, you know, start to finish. But at the same time, too, it's like culinary school. Everybody glamorizes it, right? Like, I'm going to culinary school. I am paying off those loans, like, still to this day. You know, it was it's a huge, you know, hole in your pocket. Yeah. Go, go first walk into a restaurant and ask to stage and even see if you like it. Because I think people like to cook at home. It's like vacationing, right? Like, oh, I love to go to, you know, we'll just say Austin because we're in Austin. I love to visit Austin. Living in Austin and visiting Austin are two different things. Right. Just like you said, the, you know, the idea of I want to be a pastry chef. Great, but realize it's not an overnight job. Like, you're not just going to wake up tomorrow and be Giada De Laurentiis, right? Right. So in that sense... I can relate to that because the, the, the way I became a pastry chef was I went from professional dancer mm-hmm. to going to community college, not knowing what I wanted to do. And at that point, my mom said, 
you know, the cliche, well, you know, do something that you don't have to feel like you're working every day in your life. Yeah, you know, I, what parents always tell you. Yeah. And um, funny Great enough, advice. funny enough, I was like, I want to be the pastry, like, I want to be the, the giada of, like, the pastry world. Yeah. And it's it's not glamorous, you know. Like I touched earlier, you're you're missing birthdays and holidays and you really sacrifice your time and you know, like we were talking about earlier, your health. I mean, there's so many things that just go into this day. It's not like nine to five, you sit at a desk. Oh no. I when that last person, you know, finishes their plate on their meal, you can close your station down. Pastry is always the last station to close. You know, you're there till 12, 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. It's 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 not glamorous by any means. I mean, the end product is ta very tasty, but um, it's rewarding. Yeah. So if, if this is something you really want to do, walk into a kitchen, message a chef, email them, social media, DM them, whatever. Work for them for a day and see if you like it before you apply to culinary school and have hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. <laughs> okay, so this was fun. We got to do it again. Um, Always. It's so good to see you. Where, where can people find you, follow you, learn more, and, uh, and and follow you on your journey, basically? Yeah. So I am a big poster on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my work is on at CN Duty, D O O D Y, just like Howdy Duty, uh, with an underscore at the end of it. So at CN D O O D Y underscore with that Y. And um, yeah, I mean, but, you know, through social media, I'm just a click away. All right. Thank you so much. Great seeing you. You too. Thank you all very much. If you want to support the show, you know what to do. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple, make sure you leave five stars. Nothing less than five stars. I'm a five-star man. This is a five-star podcast. Go to chefspsa.com and you can support by buying the books that I've written, including Culinary Leadership Fundamentals, Line Cook Survival Manual, Bad Sue, Good Chef, Kitchen Art of War, as well as many free ebooks that are available there. You can subscribe to my Substack channel where you get exclusive content, including podcasts that are only available to Substack members. Link is in the show notes. We'll see you next week. Hit the porno music. No small drink in the kitchen. Mix it. Drop it. Chef knowledge. No fiction. Stirring up the beats. Heating up the session. Listen close. Class is in session.